So you have to sort of expect that it won't. And you have to design your political process in a way that honors the fact that we are all basically magpies, and we are all have some kind of defensive perimeter that we need to protect. So um, what happens when these things get out of balance? Well, when the spirit of practicality takes over too much, uh, you get pra uh, practicality turns into habit. Uh, too much how and not enough why, I guess, would be my definition of habit. Um, it's interesting to look at it in the um, in the uh, terms of this hierarchy, though, because what we're, real, what we're really saying is that the spirit of geometry is colonizing the space of culture. That, we're, that geometric and engineering facts, in the absence of a strong enough dialogue with vision, turn into their own ways of doing things, which are really just habits. And, don't, and, and when you're operating up in the space of culture, and you're doing something that's going to define the future, the nature of the culture of the city, like, for example, building a giant bridge, um, you're going to have uh, if you do that all by the manual, you know, without a, a sufficient dialogue with vision, you're going to end up with something that um, that may disappoint. The cultures that I have most, I'm personally most familiar with, that tend to be very practicality driven, are highway engineering, but also conventional bus operations. People who are in the short-term bus operations business often have been promoted out of bus drivers. Um, they are, they have been selected for their ability to do it the same way every day. If it's likely for their ability to deliver you, that often makes them exactly the wrong people to try to get creativity. You know, creativity is a different set of skills. Dealing, interacting with vision is a different set of skills. And healthy transit agencies, and I, I want to say I think TriMed is a relatively healthy transit agency by North American standards. I think it's doing very well. But, the, but we have to always be aware that that's the pattern. That when we're dealing with a transit agency, we're dealing with an organization where 95% of the employees are not paid to innovate. In fact, they're discouraged from innovating because they want the bus to come the same way tomorrow as it did yesterday. Not differently just because the driver was created. <laughs> <laughs> so an example of a habit-driven voice, um, probably the two most obvious examples are something of the form of we follow the manual, um, regardless of whether the manual is actually related to your current values and goals, which often it isn't. Often a manual is a codification of the goals of, of 40 years ago. And you'll also hear something like, we've always done it this way because it works. Um, but of course, you need to have a non-circular definition of works in that sense. And again, it may, you know, that when they say it works, what it may really mean is nobody complains. And that may or may not be your definition of whether something works. At the opposite extreme, of course, if vision gets too much of the, of the argument and practicality recedes too far, you can get boondoggles, which are products that are the result of incredibly sincere, incredibly intense, incredibly visionary, and utterly impractical ideas. <laughs> and the results become disappointing. Um, um, probably the, the most tragic example of that that we've seen recently in this part of the world is the Seattle Monorail Project, which, uh, of course, consumed a great, number of, a great amount of well-intentioned energy for almost a decade before it finally failed. Um, it was a wonderful vision when people saw the images of the, of the monorail sleep, sliding sort of Jetsons-like through the city. It got lots of people very excited. Unfortunately, it wasn't very practical. Mm -hmm. So here's another example of a vision-driven voice. And this is from my friend Darren Nordahl, who made himself an enormous target by writing a book called My Kind of Transit, which argues basically that um, what's wrong with transit in this country is that it's not enough fun. <laughs> um, and he goes all the way to the point of saying that transit really needs to be slower than it is. He actually says that. A passenger to vehicle that travels a mere 10 miles per hour, such as the New Orleans streetcar, may be anathema to the current transportation ideology, uh, which I believe is me uh, and people like me. Time that is lost to the destination, however, is time afforded to the passenger to people watch window shop and sightseeing. A slow moving transit vehicle adds welcome animation to the street drawing people to it, unlike a fast one from which safety-minded pedestrians keep their distance. Now, the last point is certainly true. But, the whole, but my first reaction to that statement was, OK, Darren, you have a meeting at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Are you going to get up at, are you going to set the alarm for 6 and take the subway, or are you going to set the alarm for 5 so that you can win the on sightseeing? <coughs> um, there, is a, there is a challenge there. Because where this is coming from is coming from a very strong, interesting, fascinating cultural movement called called slowness, about slowness, slow foods, slow food, slow cities. Um, I think it's an incredibly important cultural movement. But to simply say that because we're into slowness, all of our transit should be slower, well, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a disconnect with some other realities about who we are as animals. I think you could make an interesting argument, for example, that carnivores are by definition needs some speed. 
and that we need to understand that that's also part of our wiring to the extent that even if you aren't carnivores, you are probably descended from carnivores and have a fair amount of carnivore programming. So they often become very int emotionally intense. And one of the interesting things that happens, and uh, if we go to my debate with Patrick Condon, which some of you probably read on the blog, is really a nice example of this. Patrick Condon goes from slow moving streetcars on the streets are really work very well with linear main street development to we should rip up all the bus lines in Vancouver and replace them all with streetcars. Um, and the, the, the problem there is that he has a beautiful vision of an imagined future. And you can argue about that vision. I think, the, I think that a lot of that vision looks like 1920, and I don't know if we all necessarily want to live in 1920. But you, regardless of how you feel about the vision, the problem is he's visualized the vision as a complete state and hasn't thought about the actual steps that one would go through to get from here to there. Um, so two great examples, slow transit is one. Um, Arcasanti, I don't know if any of you have been to Arcasanti, it's a wonderful, wonderful place where an incredibly visionary architect by the name of Paolo Soleri visualized the new city. Um, he visualized uh, an enormous, um, actually kind of honeycomb structured thing that people would, would live in and, and, and where they would have lots of access to the natural world because like across the road from this thing would be open space because everyone would live in this wonderful structure. Um, the problem is nobody can figure out how to transition to that. And remember the amazing thing about natural selection, which is that the process by which, you know, by which organisms evolve over time have to be viable in every single intermediate state. Every one of those intermediate states has to be able to you know, get some food, protect itself from predators, and reproduce. And that's really what's amazing about, the bio about biology. Um, what they're trying to do in Arizona is a small group of very well-intentioned people are trying to just build this thing, but they're building it very slowly because no one really knows. No, you know, no one can see the vision well enough to invest in it, and no one can see the, inter the intermediate states that it's trying to go to. Now, in our business, one of the most common examples of vision overrunning practicality would be the whole world of fixations on particular transit vehicles. Um, the belief that the selection of the vehicle uh, and, and you know, particularly the bus rail distinction is a fundamental, is the most important decision to be made about the public transport. Now, I have no illusions about this. It is the easiest one to think about if you're a journalist, say, and I'm just trying to do a quick article. It's easy to talk about, everyone understands it. Um, the fact is, however, that the most important features for determining the actual usefulness of transit, which are things like speed and frequency and reliability, are just not related to vehicle selection or not very much. Speed and reliability are mostly about the nature of the lane or running lane you operate in and what can get in your way. Um, the, the, it has very little to do with whether you're running on rails or tires. And obviously, when you're going to be running on rails in a traffic lane, you're still going to have the same kinds of issues of, 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 of things that muck up reliability because of the environment you're operating in and just simply what can go wrong in front of you on that uh, right of way. Um, so that is, this is all, so vehicle fixations in general are, are, are a challenge and we'll, and we'll always be dealing with them. So uh, one way to think about this is that when practicality overruns uh, the conversation, you get the conversations of conventional operations and bureaucratic habit, which you could describe as being stuck in the present. In other words, overly focused on how things are done right now based on the situation we're in right now, and not very good at thinking about how the way they do things could be changed. On the other hand, the opposite of the extreme, where, where vision overruns the conversation, you get visionary, exciting, urbanist thought, which is often, I think you could say, stuck in the future. <laughs> in other words, attached to a particular vision of the future, but not really interested in the question of how one would get from here to there, and more importantly, how all the intermediate steps to getting there would themselves be viable. Viable as pro products and viable as cities that you want to live in. And that's the real challenge. Um, that's why Arcasanti isn't working as a project. You know, you can't just build it to make it happen. You have to think about how it would grow into, into what you want. I just think we need more voices in the middle. Um, and that's what I have been trying to do in my own work, to be someone who knows a fair bit about transit planning and has done a fair bit of transit planning, but who's also really interested in vision. And one of the interesting things why you know, someone might want to hire a transit planner who has a PhD in theater is that if you spent 
uh, 10 years really thinking intensely and studying intensely about the arts, you have an ability to interact with vision and with the, and, and with the kind of excitement that arises, at, that can arise out of the arts, which is also the kind of excitement that can arise out of visionary urbanism. Um, I am concerned generally that the way training in these because the professions tends to be structured. People who are going into transit operations and transit management learn a very technical set of, of, of expertise that tends to bias them toward the practical. While people who are going to become architects, be, uh, uh, and particularly people who are going to become urban planners, get a lot of training in visioning and in the aesthetics, and, but, and often end up to the point of ending, ending up contemplating things that a practical person can say, you know, this is actually impossible. In fact, what you're proposing is actually geometrically impossible. It's not just culturally impossible, it's geometrically impossible. Notice that those vetoes get stronger as you go down that hierarchy, right? Ultimately, you're not going to win over geometry, if that's what, you're, uh, that's what the actual obstacle is. You might win over culture, but it's close. So again, for better outcomes, we need to, what we need to be doing is, is letting our feelings, our collective feelings, which ultimately form our culture, generate ideas. But we also have to be respecting the fact that geometry is setting some limits, physics is setting some limits, biology is setting some limits. Most of the things that you would call economics, you could probably say are a mixture of, of geometry and biology and a bit of psychology, but it's in that range. Um, psychology sets some limits. By that point, we may think we may have some room to move against those. And if we had those limits in present, present in our minds all the time, we would have more interesting, nuanced visions that actually could happen, you know, in the context of those facts of life. 